That's awesome. <laughs> Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Registers Podcast. The show is about improving the life, well-being, and productivity of mechanics everywhere. I am your host, Joshua Taylor, and today we have an interesting individual. Uh, I've seen him several Sundays now on Service Drive Live. Uh, he is a lifelong, er, a lifelong learner, uh, self-proclaimed, a dealer advocate, a market president at Dynatron. It's bad. Pat, my goodness, I can't even say your first and or last name correctly. It's Brad Pascal. We even had this at the beginning. It's Pascal, not Paschal. It's Pascal. But I didn't even get his first name right. But anyway, I think let's, let's, let's get into it. Brad, thank you very much for being on the show. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, you, you try to make it too fancy. It's not that fancy. It's kind of like me. I'm just, I'm, I'm not a fancy person. Um, but uh, sometimes the, the name looks a lot more fancy than it is. So uh, I'm glad to be here. I know I'm not traditionally like... I didn't traditionally come out of the shop, but I have some inter interesting views on, on what happens in the shop and and how I view that part of the business. So I'm I'm anxious to share those. Okay, awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to it because the I'm I'm a big data nerd, and I've always been a big data nerd. I like dissecting everything humanly possible. Like for example, I bought a brand new motorcycle last July, so we're like a year into it. So my my first real running rideable motorcycle i bought brand new in it's like july 26th is on the sticker so to speak and within four weeks i realized that it, i absolutely love riding motorcycles i waited far too long to get one but i realized that i bought the wrong bike <laughs> i love it but i bought the wrong bike yeah i continue to ride it as often as i possibly can because it's a motorcycle and i love it but i bought the wrong bike i now have a document that has 70 motorcycles on it and there are 13 categories across every single motorcycle, and they're all ranked with incredibly deep knowledge and specifications on them, trying to figure out what the next bike should be. And it might even take me a couple of years before I get the next bike and get the correct bike. But I love dissecting things on spreadsheets. And that one of the things that came up recently with the, the I don't even know which way is it, because uh, um, I know several years back it was called Dieselgate when Volkswagen had an issue. And recently we've had a, a cyber issue with CDK. It didn't get a, a fancy, fantastical name, did it? No. No, it really didn't. Not at, but all. Not at all. I understand that you helped a great many dealers out there with a plethora of spreadsheets and documents in all kinds of ways to help them through... All of that challenge, he was like, here, I like doing spreadsheets. I like doing documents here, help you through your day. Yeah. And that's, that's something that's, nice. that's one of the things, the, the giver of documents, Brad Pascal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can't take full credit for that. So, uh, that, so we were, um, my teammate, Anthony Fletcher, that works for Dynatron and myself were talking, this was the Thursday after the, after the CDK. So it's only been like a day or two. We were talking and we're, he's like, hey, you know, it'd be cool if, if we had some spreadsheets that we could send out to people to help them in this time. So within 30 minutes, I had crowdsourced all of those spreadsheets and like combined them and cleaned them up a little bit and put them together and then kind of packaged them out, posted on social media and uh, on Friday and Saturday morning, I woke up to 400 emails. <laughs> And, and so, uh, I was overwhelmed, but I spent all weekend sending out those documents to everybody. And, uh, it, and Anthony had probably 80, 90 emails in his inbox. Um, so all together, we put those up, we put those together, our marketing team, uh, cleaned them up even more over the weekend and put up a website. And I think we had almost 200 people download it from the website on top of those other ones. Wow. So, it's been, it's been, cr it's been crazy, um, busy because of that. But unfortunately, I was a marketing director in a Volkswagen store when Dieselgate hit. So I've been through two, <laughs> two of these crazy uh, things so far. And yeah, Dieselgate was a very interesting thing. And, uh, and, and you know, we made a lot of money towards the end of it, mm -hmm. doing the fixes and stuff like that. 
but mm-hmm. when you were in the thick of it, you you were really really stressing. So I think I think what's going to happen is it's going to it's going to force some of these DMSs to really uh, put more money into research and development and security and things like that. And I think it's going to end up being a blessing in disguise because what happens in every time there's a crisis is it's it, it's spent what spins out of that is innovation. And there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation on that side of things. And so I think it's going to be good for the industry and CDK is a partner of ours and, a, you know, you know, we get a lot of data from them and, and partner with them. So it's unfortunate that it happened, but I think a lot of innovation is going to spin out of it. Awesome. I think it's necessary too. There's, you know, we talk a lot about insurance in terms of consumer insurance, car insurance, house insurance, personal insurance, liability insurance, business insurance, things of that nature. And one of the things that, that came up quite regularly that, that I heard about on, on uh, podcasts and shows, much like Peter Smith's uh, Innovators and Disruptors, um, he was talking about cybersecurity. And I can't remember who it was that was on the show at the time, and they were talking about it, is that even the cybersecurity insurance that exists – for dealers currently was incredibly inadequate based on the circumstances that it, that occurred, whereby the attack was on CDK, not the dealer. And as a result, the dealer was out money because it's CDK down. But the independent dealers had technically no coverage for that kind of outage because it, yes, it was a cyber attack, but it wasn't a cyber attack on them directly. It was a cyber attack on somebody else that affected them. So I think even... In terms of innovation, innovation is going to come absolutely from it. I think policy changes as a whole is going to be completely revamped because as, as, as you know, with car, any car systems, like if you get a CAN bus failure, failure, you know, if a, if a mouse ate a, a wire in the back and you had a CAN bus failure on a car that's under warranty, that's not warranty. Is it a failure of the car? Is the car a failure and, they can, and you can't drive it? Absolutely. Is it a warranty? Absolutely not. Yeah. So it, it's kind of that indirect failure point that, that has to come up and, and get corrected in terms of policy. So it'd be interesting to see how those changes come to, for the entire industry as we go forward. I think they're going to get it from every angle because something else that nobody talked about is how many of those, how many of those CDK customers service DOD cars? or military mm-hmm. vehicles or all of that stuff. And if they got access to some of those information, they could track those vehicles for the agents that are undercover and different things like that. I know for a fact that the DOD flew immediately to CDK. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's a scary fact, right? It puts, it puts people that service cars at dealerships um, kind of at risk if that if that information was a- accessed. So there's going to be some pressure from the government on top of that to make sure that that data is secure um, mm-hmm. down the road because it's going to be their agents also, right? So um, that's a, it's a, it's a scary thing to think about. Uh, and one of my dealers brought it up to me, and I was like, oh, that's that's wild. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, and it's. There's a domino effect there too, right? Because it's not just going to be CDK. It's going to be every DMS, you know, provider. And yep. hopefully, hopefully every provider of software in the industry is going to take a, a good, long, hard look at what occurs as they integrate or API connect with other platforms. Because you're no longer just talking about uh, individual platforms connecting with individual platforms. You're talking about a multi the, the multiverse, as it were, because, you know, I went reflect back to, I think, a, I wrote an article, it feels like forever ago, so much so I have to go back to reference material. But um, the average service manager at the time that I canvassed was opened 13 different pieces of software every day. Wow. And if you've got 13 different pieces of software, that means you have 13 different connections at least – if not the interconnection that happens between those 13 pieces that go out. How yeah. easy is each one to access? And if you can access one, how many others can you then access? It's a whole spider web of yeah. holy shit um, that you have to worry about. So interesting. So let's let's perhaps take it back to the beginning. 
And let's let's give us some a little bit of control for the show, as we always do. We have the four questions that we always ask. Um, the first question for you, who didn't start in the industry at a young age, like many do, um, what got you into automotive? Um, so I was working at um, a store called Lumber Liquidators. I was a st- I was a store manager here in Amarillo, and uh, one of the general managers of the auto group came in and bought floors from me and my teammates and uh he came back and he said uh hey do you all three of you guys want to come to, into the car business and at that time lumber liquidators had some impending lawsuits and some lacy act violations and all kinds of stuff so i didn't see a super bright future in that company which hence since then they've been through changes all kinds of changes and revamps and stuff like that so uh, I went to work for the Volkswagen store and the two guys that worked for me went to work for the Toyota store. And so I loved, I loved the Volkswagen store. I started at a brand new Volkswagen point that had been open like three months when I got there. Mm-hmm. And so um, started uh, my first job was taking pictures of the cars and, and sailing at the same time. Uh, and then I worked my way up through, through the, to started their BDC, started the internet, uh, uh, like marketing side of the department, and then uh, became the marketing director over both both stores, the Toyota and the Volkswagen store, uh, and did that for a while while still selling cars. So I was still selling cars while I was a marketing director. Um, and luckily, I've had some like fantastic people uh, in my path to really, really help help me out along the way. And uh, pretty much had a general manager that was like taught me every part of the business and and taught me um, diff- different things that most people don't tell me or don't tell you in the car business. And then I had a mentor like Damian Boudreaux. And this is where it ties into the technicians is I was best friends with every single technician. I was best friends with every single lot porter, with everybody in the detail shop. Because what's your best source of referrals is the people that you see every day. So mm-hmm. I would bring the, I would bring them stuff all of the time, like energy drinks and Cokes and stuff like that. And I still do that when I go into stores is I still take stuff to the technicians and stuff like that. Because if you can, if you take care of a service manager's people, they will give you as much time as you want. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's like a little hack in dealerships to for, to get a little bit of time so that I can kind of break down some barriers to really try to help help those people. Awesome, awesome. I saw I saw a picture. I think you you did a had a selfie. Um, what was the statement? You know, the salespeople are always distraught when you walk into the store right. because you've got a case of Monster and it's not for them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of honorary because I used to be a sales guy, so salespeople get everything. So I purposely walk through the showroom, and then all the sales guys are like looking at you. And then when you go to service, they're like, "What? That's not normal. <laughs> I, it's, it's not normal for someone to do that." So it's it's kind of fun for me because there's that natural rivalry between sales and service, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I like to say, I like to say, why should sales get all the cool shit? Right. And my job is to bring cool tools and stuff to the service side and give them some cool stuff too. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I look at it. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I'll say it a thousand times. And and there are other people saying it too. Sales sells the first car. Service sells every car after that. Because if the service department doesn't rock, they're not going to come back and buy another car. Yeah. It's just in reality the best funnel that you have is your service department. Now, functionally too, here is the thing, just because I say that the service department sells car two, car three, car four, and so forth. If you don't have a quality sales department, you can't close anything. Yeah. So just like you need a, so, sorry, let me, let me rephrase this a little bit better because this came up in recent conversations as well. There's a technician shortage, there's a technician shortage, there's a technician shortage. Chris Craig and I go on at length about the shortage and all of the different aspects that play a role in the shortage. It'd be awesome if all the vendors treated the service department like 
you do, Brad, where you walk into the service department and provide the service department with some love. But one of the things that's missed in the technician shortage is the ability to close in the drive. If you don't have people who can close on the sales floor, you don't sell cars. If you don't have people who are able to close in the drive, you don't have good sales in the service department. And if you don't have good sales in the drive, you don't have any work. And if you don't have any work, you don't have any technicians. The first thing to do in your dealership if you are having struggles keeping or acquiring technicians is have a good, long, hard look at your service drive and your ability to close deals. And if you want to know what works and what isn't working and what, you know, what part of the menu works and what part of your gross works, guess what we lead into? We lead into data. And that's where Dynatron comes into play. You've got to look at all of the bells and whistles and all of the little nooks and crannies for places where you can make more money. And the great way to do that is to dig into the data and mm -hmm. dig into the data from the service drive. Yeah, I think that's important. You know, um, there's really only three ways to increase gross profit, right? You can optimize price, you can sell more to each customer, or, or you can um, drive more customers into the store, right? But the, the, the foundation of everything is making sure that your prices are optimized. If we took, if we look at most service departments, there's 3,600 to 4,800 price points in most service departments. If we told a used car manager he had to price that many cars without Viato, that dude's blowing out of here in two seconds, right? <laughs> so, so why, fast. Why, He'd be out so fast. Yeah, why do we make our service managers do that without without tools to to make sure that those prices are fine tuned? It, it it's kind of silly because we don't always take the sales perspective and apply it to the service department, right? So like if we go ask any salesperson in America what their job is, they're gonna say to sell cars, period. Mm -hmm. If we ask service advisors, we might get 15 different answers. Mm -hmm. Why, why is that? It's because we have a set sales process for the sales department, we know. Meet, greet, build report, ask qualifying questions, vehicle. Even if you're in service, you know the stupid sales process, right? Mm -hmm. Every single person in the store knows this process. But what's that process looking look like for the service department? And if you don't have that established, you're not going to have that same consistency. And you can't come in there. You know, most service advisors don't like salespeople because sales is kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. It's just kind of, uh, but what they don't realize is, is they're not really selling stuff. The, what they're doing is they're making sure that every single, every single customer that leaves there is safe, period. Mm -hmm. So as Damien Boudreaux, who's one of my mentors says, he says, you, that lady needs to know that if she drives out of there, her mama is going to be safe driving that car, that car down the road. And if you talk about things in safety, whenever you're on the drive and say, hey, look, this stuff right here is really, really important to get fixed so that you gotta be looking in that car to see if there's a, a child safety seat or a dog call or, or a whatever's in there, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, if you drive off this drive and you have and you have your two kids, you know, how, how old are the, the, your kids are eight and 12, or eight and six? Okay, we wanna make sure they're safe while you're driving off this drive. These are the areas that are in yellow that you might not need to take care of them right now, but we're gonna need some time down the road. I'm gonna go ahead and pencil this in for me to call you at this time, at this at this point, you know what I mean? So you set a plan, a follow-up plan, just like you would on the sell side, right? You're gonna call your customers to ask for referrals if you're a good salesperson. You're gonna call your customers to to, to check in on them to make sure everything's going on. You're going to send stuff on anniversaries and birthdays and stuff like that. Why is it our advisors don't do the same thing? And every single advisor can tell you, I don't have time. Well, malarkey, absolute malarkey. Because yeah. you want to make, so this is, this is a gripe I have I, from, from a person who's been on the bench, on the desk, in the big chair, I can say without question, you have time or you haven't made time. Yeah. You have to make time. And you go, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I got this. I got this. Guess what? 
It's still on you to figure out the process that works, that still allows you to follow the steps that have been outlined by your service manager or your fixed director or whoever. You need to follow this very specific brand steps, the, the specific dealer steps. If there is a hundred steps before you even get to the meet and greet, something else is wrong. But yeah. it shouldn't be difficult. We're literally coming in on SDO. Joe Chambers is doing a whole series of like back to back to back Sundays talking about the meet and greet, talking about the walk around, talking about the sales process in the service drive to get it ironed out because it's really not that complicated. No, it really isn't. As long as you follow it's, I would say it's no more than about 10 steps. Are there micro steps in there? Absolutely. But is it no more than 10 steps? Absolutely not. It's 10 steps. And if you do the 10 steps on every single customer and at the end of the day, you go, okay, who's the customers that I haven't talked to in three months. Okay. There's 20 of them. Make 20, bang out 20 calls. Most, yeah. of them are gonna go, most of them are going to go to the voicemail anyway at that time we of day. We have a pre-scheduled text now. Pre-scheduled text. All I've got to do is pre-schedule a text or, and or say, you know, you know, I, I'm going to tell you two things that will change everything. And this is probably the goal, the best nugget that I've ever seen in my life, okay? Um, so if I come in here to my phone, and I'm going to see if I can do this uh, live here. So if I come into my phone and I hit share contact, if you see on your on the phone here down at the bottom, always select two things. I always select my company and I always select my birthday. And can you, can you take a screenshot of that very spot? Yeah. Take a yeah. screenshot and send it to me because then I'll put it on the screen when when, when this goes yeah. out. So, so the reason why I select my birthday is because it will automatically put it on everybody's calendar whenever you share your contact. It goes what? on everybody's calendar. And so every year, April's my biggest month of the year because everybody gets my ball my, my birthday notification. And I've been doing it since I was a sales guy. And so uh, it, everybody gets the birthday notification. And so that's like one trick I do. The other, the other thing I want people to think about is as we're talking about the sales process, Josh, when's the last time you heard an advisor ask for a referral? Never. Why not? Never. Why? Why? If we're having the most interactions in the store with customers, why are we mm -hmm. not teaching these advisors how to ask for referrals? I used to all the time. That's part of my, I was part of my follow-up process, either text, emails, or phones. When I was called out after, yeah. this is going back, you're going to have to go back and bear with me on this one. It's going back a bit, but at the Chrysler store, near the end of my time at the Chrysler store while I was an advisor, I had a fairly large book of business and it, I think it was like step five or six. If I hadn't seen somebody, I was asking for a referral as part of the process. Now it probably should be let, it should have been like step one or two, yeah. but referral, 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 repeat. Yeah. Well, what is, what does Russell say? Re repeat referral and retention. Yeah. The, the, the best way that I've seen to do it is add a little comic relief and be like, Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody else that drives a car? <laughs> and then they go into it and they're like haha ha, fun you know what i mean uh-huh so so it's it's not as it's so much easier to ask for that in the service department than it is in sales and anybody can do that so yeah. anybody listening hey it doesn't have to be just the service advisors that take that piece of advice mechanics right. out there if you're working at an independent shop or you're an owner operator at an independent shop take that same advice Put, send out your contact information when you do it. Make sure the, the birthday thing is selected. And secondly, asking for referrals. Do you know anybody that drives a car? Yeah. yeah. That's humor. Yeah. Ask for it. Humor. Just, and, just and if, if they it. stymie you, if they stymie you and they, say, they keep saying no and you've asked at least twice, then you say, man, I thought you would, I would have thought you had more friends than that. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then it kind of breaks it down again and that and you're able to drill it down one more time and then you'll usually get some i've got i've got i've done that to dip car dealers multiple times and got um got referrals out of car dealerships by by putting it on them a little different way you know putting a little more pressure on them a little different way well it it sounds like you're doing things a little bit differently regardless yeah. taking monster into service you're you're pushing your birthday onto their calendar you're asking <laughs> yeah. did they drive a car that's three different things in a row that you're asking for that I have never heard somebody from service ever actually do or somebody who is not in service now who is an outside source doing it 
Yeah, so I, I try now everybody's gonna steal it, you know how the car business is, which which I'm I'm okay with that, but I try to constantly come up I have a brainstorming session on a weekly basis just with myself and I try to come up with new innovative ways that that I'm gonna reach out because you you gotta understand I sell to the best salespeople in the world, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm not three steps ahead of them, I, I get no respect, right? So if you do something like that um for instance like there was a techion customer today going through a dms switch i i I did a 20 group presentation he's interested in the product but he's writing a dms switch so instead of taking monsters in there i door dashed them to him and didn't tell him until (laughs) until he got him and so he's like dude you're a maniac right so i try to do stuff that's different um there was a guy that uh he was kind of ghosting me for a couple weeks and uh I figured out his favorite football team and sent him a, a, a autograph like mini helmet and said, why are you d- dodging me? Like I'm a defensive back. So like mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do fun stuff like that because it catches, it catches people off guard. And if I can get, if I can get the, the barriers down, then it gives me a chance to really grab some attention and help them out and show them what we do and mm-hmm. show them how we're going to get them a good return on investment. Awesome. I think the outside the box th- thinking also helps, right? Doing things that nobody expects. Yeah. But it's not in a, in a, and it may even be a little bit cringe. Who gives a shit if it's a little bit yeah. cringe? Because if nobody else is doing it, if you're being yeah. unique, you're being yourself, it's like, hey, we're outside of the box thinkers over here. Yeah. We're here to help you make money. I know everybody says we're here to help you make money, but guess what? Everybody does the same thing. Guess what? We do things differently i've already shown you that i remember to give you an example when we were at nada and we were you know team with teams are in the different cars we rented a couple of cars so there was like 12 or 13 of us in a couple of cars and we're getting stories i was getting stories from the other leaders at fixed ops marketing and listening to russell speak getting getting to spend time one-on-one with russell is amazing just anytime i get to spend with the men i just can sit and listen with them but he told me this one story that goes back Ages and ages ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. It could have been five years. It could have been 30 years ago. He's been doing it a while. He said he literally sent a plastic foot to somebody. He sent a plastic foot to somebody as as that same kind of doing something different. It's like, now that I got my foot in the door, can I get a sales call? Like the stuff that's outside the normal. Do the stuff that's outside the normal. You know, and somebody, uh, what was it? Somebody said one of the greatest cold email subject lines that I have ever seen as, as now a GM or whatever in a business is I, this individual sent me an email and there was almost nothing in the body of the email. The only thing that was, was their signature, which was obviously their company name, their company logo, a link to the company website that was obviously probably tracked. The subject line was literally his name, his name and his phone number. That's it. That's brilliant. I love it. I'm going to try that this Take week. It. I'm going to try it this week. Take it and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Because they, all they have to do is die. Okay. They look at it. It's like, why is somebody sending me their phone number? And they look, yeah. it's Dynatron. Oh, I know who they are. Who's you, this? Who's this guy sending me his phone number? There, there, there's a couple I use. I use, uh, <laughs> there, I, I use one that just says, there's two that I use. Number one, like if I'm not getting, if, if, if someone kind of goes dark, I just say, what happened? Mm-hmm. That's it. Just, and, and, and nine times out of 10, they don't want to leave you hanging if you, if you say something like that. Or the other one I use is, have you given up on this project? Question mark. And that's a little more aggressive, uh, but nobody wants to be a quitter, right? So you get people, we're, we're in the car business where you have a ton of type A personalities. Mm-hmm. So if you if you ask something like that, they're always nine out of ten times they respond. So now it could be something that that's going on in the store that I don't know about, right? It could be multiple different things, but it gets a conversation started and gets it back going. I don't use those very I use those very sparingly, um, but I do a lot of gifts and memes and stuff like that when I'm you know when I'm texting or something like that. So. Uh, the meme I've closed the most deals on is Patrick the starfish crying when someone's gr- ghosting me. That's like the meme that like it, it closes deals. If you're 
if you're listening to this and you're in the BDC and someone's ghosting you or 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 you're trying to get some something close, man, you 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 throw that meme in there. They're gonna they're gonna respond. It's pretty funny. I'd I'd love my brother Sean Armour to actually do that as part of one of his BDC campaigns and give yeah. me some feedback on what the closing ratio is on through oh, a service. Campaign. That would be just just send just send that. Yeah, yeah. It would be interesting to see because I would say sixty to seventy percent of the time I close I close a deal with that. So uh, usually if I get them in my rotation, like. Uh, as far as my follow-up, my follow-up's insane. So I have deals that I've been working on a year and mm-hmm. the guy's like, you're relentless, but it's not, it's always different every time I make sure to apply creativity. That's the, that's the thing that people don't do in the car business. And it drives me nuts is they don't apply their creativity to their follow-up and they don't apply their creativity on how they handle things. You'll see technicians make you'll see technicians make video in the back and they're like, Oh man, I got to do this video instead of they could be creative with it. Right. There's mm-hmm. ways to be, to show your creativity and to show off your personality. And I take everything as a challenge. So like someone tells me, no, I'm like, all right, game on, let's go. You know what I mean? I'm going to make you like me so much that eventually you're going to say like, yes. Right. And so, um, I have a deal. I think there's an opportunity there. I think there's a very big missed opportunity there. Yeah, And, you know, I've talked to technicians through coaching that, you know, I'm not comfortable doing the video on MPIs. I'm not comfortable being on video. I'm not comfortable being on cannabis. Like, you just got to be yourself. It, it doesn't matter. Just be yourself. But you got to be in. You got to be in it. Yeah. If you're not willing to, like, it's part of the process at your store. Like, you hear John Fraser. You hear Zach Perkle, Joe Chambers, Ray Hernandez, La- Lamont Harris, everybody at you know, SDL. It's like video MPIs completely changed the sales landscape in the service drive. They completely changed the sales landscape. And it comes down to the technician's ability to speak. Now, you're not going to get it right the first time. You're not going to get it right the, the hundredth time. You're not even going to get it right necessarily the thousandth time. You're not going to be an expert until you do it 10,000 times. But guess what? You touch five cars a day, minimum. You do it five days a week, minimum. That's 25 cars, which means you're doing 100 a month, which is 1,200 a year. Yep. You know, ten, like it's going to take you a while to get good at it. And guess what? People don't buy shit from you as a technician, whether you're in a dealer or independent, if they don't know who you are. So yep. be in the video. Yep. Don't take the video like you're, hold, you're holding up the phone. Where's my phone? You're holding up the phone like this to the car, right? They're, they're filming the car. They're filming the car. Film yourself in the frame, filming the car. They want to know who you are. They yeah. want to know who you are the tech as the technician. Who is it that's fixing my car? I want to see my car, and I want to see you. They almost don't care what you say at that point. You can be blah, 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 all over the bloody video. It doesn't matter. They want to see you, and they want to see the car. And yeah. if there's no problem, they want to see what the problem is. They're craving, craving transparency. They're craving t- transparency. And so would like, you it, would you still call it transparency? Cause I'm, I'm borderline, like I'm on the fence now where it's no longer transparency. They just want to know who they want to build relationship with that person. They well, want relationships with people. If you think about this, where does 70% of the business go? Independence, right? Exactly. Every single independent, you can watch your car get worked on almost, almost every single one of them. You and can they can go out and shake the hand of the person fixing it. Yeah. Yeah. So w- they're, they're uh they're craving to know what's going on and they're craving for those relationships because they want to they want to be able to trust the person working on their car right and the only way to establish trust is to create a relationship or show show be transparent about what's going on in the in the back of the uh, back of the shop you know what we did when i was in the dealership is we instituted even though i wasn't a technician we had quick video back in the day. We were like one of the very first ones to do video, right? This is before X time had video. This is before co video had it. This is before anybody had those things. And we did, we did quick video. And what we would start to do is the salespeople would introduce to the advisors and say, this is your advisor. And then the technicians, when they recorded their video, they'd say, Hey, I'm your technician. So-and-so powerful. This is what's going on with your car. 
And then we would have people come in, say, no, I'll wait. I want so-and-so to work on my car. And you're like, mm -hmm. it's such a powerful experience because you're personalizing it. And then they get to know that those people, like we have one master tech back there. He's been there since the beginning. His name is Lamb. And um, there's not a, there's not a, a Laotian person in the city that come in, that brings their car in there that, that doesn't wait for Lamb because he, he's huge in the, he's, you know, that's his people and they're, they want to, they want him to work on his car because they've got those videos in the service department. They, he, they're active in the community. So all of our, all, all, one thing that we also do that kind of connected the whole dealership that really got me onto the vendor side is we, we did a survey of the whole entire company and we figured out what nonprofits they were involved in. And then what we did is we created a calendar and we adopted those nonprofits around whatever their big event was. Cause most nonprofits have one big event a year. That's a fundraiser or something. Mm -hmm. and so then we would rotate. And so if like I'm against, if, if I'm for like kids with disability and you're for American heart association, you want me to help you. So you come help with my event. And so it creates this thing to where all of the technicians, all the advisors, all the parts people, everybody's always hanging out together. And mm -hmm. so they don't have those silos in that, in, in that department. And if they, the one time that they did have a silo where a parts person and an advisor weren't getting along, the GM made them switch jobs for like two weeks. And, and then that dissipated the whole thing. So uh, that's some stuff that I don't think they do very often in the service department too, is that every single service advisor should have to go to finance warranty training, mm -hmm. right? Every single parts advisor should be able to write service. Every single service advisor should be able to do parts. And, and, and it came in crucial in the dealership I came from during COVID because they didn't, they didn't miss a blink because they had everybody cross trained. The only thing that I would add into that now that I've spent a lot more time with, with Wendy Reeves, Sean Armour, talking about BDC and understanding BDC, and I know understand that I know that Zach Perkle, yeah. they're, requ they're required as an advisor to spend 30 days in the BDC. Oh, 100%. That's like, a, it's that's those, those three, between your F&I, your service advisors, and your parts advisors, and your BDC, those, sorry, yeah. four, technically, when if you can rotate those through so everybody knows what everybody else is doing in terms of at least the basics so right. they can comprehend you know what is going to benefit as an as an adv service for service advisor what's going to benefit f and i so when i have a customer come in and this is what i would do as an advisor myself this is this is how i did this i literally did this what as a service advisor is my f and i my sales and leasing people what is the thing that they want from me they want customers who are already prepped, who have already done their research, and have already been given, whether it's bad news or not, but they have a relationship with the dealership. So when I have a customer come in that I knew we weren't fixing their car, we weren't fixing their car, because I have a rule, and this is another little bit of a segue nugget as well. I use the 70% rule in service as a service advisor. If the car comes in and the repair bill is large, Say the repair bill is large. There's lots of gravy on it, but the repair bill is large. And the customer goes, ah, ah there's so much money. I, did, I just, it, I, why don't I just get a new car? 70% of the value of the replacement on the year. So if the replacement, let's say, let's say they drive a, a Grand Cherokee. Right now it's an old Grand Cherokee and the repair bill is seven grand. Okay. Let's say it's seven grand. And that's forecasting what's going to happen over the next 12 months. Their replacement. Well, what would you get in replacement? Oh, I'd get a new one. I love this thing, but it's old and it's broken and it's seven grand to fix it. Well, what's a new one going to cost you? Well, it's probably going to cost me 50 grand. Well, what's the, what's the rough monthly going to be after taxes and all the extra other stuff? Because this one, you don't owe anything on this one, right? It's, it's old enough. You don't know. No, I don't want it. Oh, it's going to be about a thousand dollars a month. Thousand dollars a month. That's 12 grand in a year. Well, yeah. Well, seven grand gets you this one covered for the next two to two years or more. So you're going to save five grand this year if you fix it. Right. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. But guess what? The opposite ha then happens. You use the same rule every time. Every time you have that conversation over a period of time with any customer, 70% rule, 70% rule, 70% rule. 
Another customer comes up, says, oh, well, I, I love this Grand Cherokee, but it's seven grand to fix. Well, how much is it going to be replaced? Well, I, I don't need the Cherokee anymore. I can, I could probably go, you know what, maybe that new Hornet, it's only, you know, 35. Yeah. You know, it's $600 a month all in. Okay, well, that's $7,200 for the year. And it's seven grand to fix this. That's almost 100% of the value of the repair. Let's just take you up front. Right. Because more than likely for the last six months, I've been telling them, What's recommended? What's required? What's recommended? What's required? What's recommended? What's required? And they decline, decline, decline. It's like, hey, we've been having this conversation now for six months. We've had a couple of issues. We had a couple of fixes. I've rolled that all into the seven thousand dollars. You've already spent a certain amount of money, and you got another certain amount of money to come. Right, seventy percent. You know my rule. I've been telling you for six months, a year. Yeah, man. Like, let's let's just go up and do it. So now I have a prepped customer who's been reasonably spoken to and communicated to for a long period of time, I can literally walk them up. They're a lay down for the yeah, F&I. Well, you've qualified and you train, right? train that customer over time. And it's in their best interest because you're looking out for them and you're trying to save them the most amount of money, right? So not mm -hmm. only are you talking to them in the form of safety, but you're also talking to them and, hey, this is going to save you money. This is going to save you time. This is going to say, you know, any way that you can save them anything that they can, the anything possible, it's going to be a win-win situation for the customer. And I, you know, there's, there's advisors that do that out there that take their job seriously that, you know, I, I like going into um, service departments and just sitting back. I'll sit back. I won't go directly in. Even if I have a meeting, I'll go in 10 minutes early and I'll just watch in the service drive for a little bit. And I want to see how many customers come up and hug the service advisor and mm. I'm, you know, you know, I want to see those type of people and it kind of gives you, it, it gives you, it, it gives you a whole, I have a whole different respect for the service side of the business. Um, now that I'm on it versus when I was on the sell side, because what, what, what I realize is, is man, it's complicated. Sales isn't that complicated. It's really not as complicated as we make it. Service is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts to it. And it takes a team doing everything together to really, really make that work, right? You can't have a lot of rifts between technicians and service advisors and sales managers and BDC and you know and parts people. It 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 will kill that service department faster than than almost anything. Um mm -hmm. what I'm excited about is the is the evolution of the tech stack in the service side of stuff. You know, you have amazing tools like, like, like Bailey and, and, um, true spot and, and, and UBI. UBI and companies like this that are finally innovating in the service side of stuff. Like, uh, there's another one called socket times, pretty interesting. And there's, there's, there's a lot of cool companies out there. And things are starting to talk to each other, which has historically been the downfall of the service department is nothing talks to get anything mm -hmm. very well. Even even X times getting on board and it has finally created a widget for the website instead of a frame in. So mm -hmm. we're starting to move this forward because because fix ops directors are have been a part of the marketing conversation and the tech conversation and are starting to get into that side of the conversations and the dealerships which I'm all about, man. You know, I, you don't have to know everything about the technology or marketing, but you, you need to be in the conversation and give your perspective mm -hmm. it's valuable for that. And so that's the stuff that I set back and watch that excites me um, in the industry and gives me, gives me hope for the service department. Because I think as, you know, I, I don't believe EVs are coming as fast as everybody probably thinks, but no. as EVs come out, as EVs I think, genuinely speaking, I think it, it, I think whatever ramp that we've had over the last period of time, I think we've I think we're at a plateau point. And yeah. I somebody can fact check me, please, please fact check me and, and put the numbers up and, and let, let us have a discussion. But I think we've plateaued in terms of overall sales of EVs because I think there's now too many people out there that are going, well, maybe this isn't sustainable as it is. Right? I've always been very happy with the performance of EVs and what they can do. I, I'd love to get me a Plaid. I'd absolutely love to get me a Plaid. But it's not realistic for where we live. Not right. even remotely realistic for where we live and the, and the type of lifestyle that we live. Hybrids, on the other hand, completely different story. 
Yeah. Hybrids on a completely different story because as we evolve as a species, how do we function better as we go forward? We function better when we have more than one thing that does something good for us. Well, yeah. when you have a, a hybrid, regardless of what fuel you use, you're going to use less fuel and you use less of the thing that is not sustainable, which is building the batteries. Oh, and that gives us more time to come up with more solutions for the battery, which is our biggest hiccup currently. Well, that, yeah. well currently until you see all of the, the current crash testing that's being done on Hummers and uh, large size EVs that are blowing through barriers. That's a thing. That's yeah. a concern. Like my wife saw, I didn't prompt this. My wife saw one of those videos. That's not good. Yeah. Like this isn't good. This yeah. isn't good. Right. <laughs> So it's a, it's a danger and it's scary, but then you go back to things like how do we loop in and integrate all of these systems? How do we loop in and integrate all of these different fuels and different systems and EV and hybrid and, and hydrogen and propane and all of the conversations that are being had? Like we're not even talking about the, the – we're not even getting deep into automotive into what's happening in the HD market where they've got engines that are being able to be supported by like three or four different kinds of fuel. Yeah. Right? You have diesel engines being produced. You can You can buy – uh, corn oil or cor not corn oil, corn fuel. You got E85 and, and so on and so forth being run in some of the diesels. You've got propane, you've right. got natural gas, you've got fuel, or sorry, not fuel, but diesel. And you've got hydrogen that's being like, so some of this shit is crazy and it's going to come to automotive too. Yeah. I think, you, you know, there's even diesel hybrid engines that people don't know about. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's, there's all kinds of stuff that's out there. Actually, I'm 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 about to make the switch. So uh, I have an eco diesel Ram, and I'm about to make the switch to a hybrid Tundra. So uh, I'm because uh, I don't want to lose my gas mileage, and uh, uh -huh. and and, uh, and I love the Tundras, and uh, we're kind of a Toyota household. So my wife has a lime green TRD four runner that'll not never be off roaded. Uh, probably so, so uh, but both of us came out of the Toyota store. Both of us came out of the Toyota store. The interesting thing is, is going to be if EVs pop off, like they're saying, they're going to pop off eventually. We're going to uh -huh. get chances at all those customers because we're the only ones that are going to have the technology off the bat. Right. Yep. So what's a better time to get your cadence tuned in than right now. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're not thinking about that they're just starting to do is EV rated tires, right? So they have some EV rated tires, but what about all the tires that are already on the market that aren't rated for EVs, right? They're heavier, more lower end torque, you mm -hmm. know, instant torque basically. So tires are going to be the new thing, man. And so how do we, how do we go about, what's the ways that we go about selling those tires and what's the ways that we really get in there and how do we be competitive against some of these independents? Because we're gonna we're about to get our shot, and mm -hmm. we need to be prepared prepared when we get that shot to recapture some of that business that goes to these third party places, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's the thing that I think about constantly is like, how can I help prepare the dealers that I work with for that opportunity down the road, right? Mm -hmm. So. So from that aspect, you know, you were at a, a Volkswagen store. It sounds like you went from a Volkswagen store to a Toyota store. And then what what occurred between then and now? Because a lot lots has, has occurred in your life. You went from being in retail to then not being in retail. You're doing a bit of consulting, which isn't your primary focus. Your primary focus now is Dynatron. What 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 was the 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 catalyst to take you from being in the store to not? Yeah. So, so, um, so from the Volkswagen store, I took over marketing for the Toyota and the Volkswagen store, uh, at the same time. And we created that idea that I shared with you about the community impact calendar. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of my friends told me, Hey, you should present that at driving sales for like best idea. And I'm like, man, I'm not a public speaker. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. You know, I, I had, and, and, and so my boss, John Luciano, was like, hey, I'll put you through Dale Carnegie. And so I went through the Dale Carnegie class and, and stuff like that. And this was 2015. I I submitted for that best idea and I forgot about it. <laughs> and like, I did. I forgot all about it. And a month after that, they called me and said, hey, you're in the top five. You have to come to Vegas and present at the Bellagio. 
And one of the other guys that's in the top five is Brian Armstrong from Southtown VW, who's like one of my mentors. And I'm like, I got to go up against the guy that like <laughs> taught me marketing. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fantastic because I'm not a public speaker. All these people's done public speaking before. That's There's no way that anybody listening to this right now thinks that you don't do public speaking. Yeah, and yeah. I, what I mean, many people don't realize is it's just because we're not – public speaking right now it's just literally a recorded conversation folks yeah. anybody that keeps telling me well I, i'm not a public speaker i i don't yeah. you know i've never done recording before fuck off we're just having a conversation yeah. it's just recorded it's yeah. just recorded i 100 percent, i agree with you and so i talked to boudreaux before i did this presentation <laughs> and he, said, and he he's like my he's like my so the the beautiful thing about this human being named damien boudreaux who's a I guess you would say he's a sales trainer, but he's not really a sales trainer. Uh, he he He's a beautiful individual to where he has ability to ask you questions to where you question yourself, and that's where you make real changes in your life. And I've never met anybody like this guy in my life, and he's been very influential and a fantastic mentor to me. But he's, he told me, he goes, let me ask you a question. How about if you don't go up there and public speak, but you just go up there and speak from your heart. And I was like, freaking like Jedi mind tricks over here. Right. So, yeah. so Brad, now that, realize, that's a known issue. Yeah. Right. That's a known issue. We know that we always conflate things that we're either afraid of, or we yeah. don't know anything about, right. Just go up and talk. You're, yeah. it, who cares if there's people in the room? Who, who cares if there's people watching this right now? Nobody cares. Right. Just have a good time, say your piece, say what you want to say, say what you're passionate about, and move on with your day. It's just another day. It makes it it makes it so much easier, right? Because if you just speak what you're passionate about, and I didn't have to worry about all the other stuff, right? I just spoke with what I'm passionate about. And then I ended up winning the contest. And this was in the height of driving sales where there was like two, 3,000 people in the room. Mm -hmm. And then I got bombarded with vendor job offers and because i it was kind of it kind of i wouldn't say it put me on the map but it brought some notor notoriety and mm -hmm. i had been and you know i had i had done a couple crazy things at the dealership that made like automotive news before that like um when pokemon go was huge we we uh we we dropped a bunch of lures on a pokey stop on a sunday and sold a bunch of cars like like some crazy stuff like that like so i had a little bit of I had a little bit of publicity before this happened, but it put our whole store on the map, right? And then we used that same idea in Akio Toyota that same year had a contest of best ideas in dealerships. And out of the whole the whole uh, world, our idea got third. And so between the those two things, um, and I also was the number three Volkswagen CPO salesman that year and that between the between the wave of all of that stuff um a lot of vendors came 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 calling and i wanted to, to help people at marketing wise the way that i helped the dealership and really kind of take take those talents and help other people so um i went to work for a big agency and uh and started doing marketing and spent spent the primary the majority of my career there until COVID happened. And then I moved over to the fixed ops digital team and really dove it, dove into the fixed ops side of stuff and learned the fixed ops side and spent some time uh, pretty often with my old GM of him teaching me different things and going through financials and looking at things different ways and figuring out how to market the fixed ops side of the department and created some pretty created the very first dynamic fixed ops ads created the very first dynamic Facebook fixed ops ads that anybody had ever seen. And so I was really fortunate to get to do that stuff. And then I just got tired of answering the question, um, what the ROI is on marketing because everybody asks that question and it's, there's so many different touch points. And it's so hard to manage and it's so hard to prove. And so I decided I'm going to go to work for a company that has a guaranteed, a guarantee with a product. And mm -hmm. that's the Dynatron. I met, they came on my podcast that I did. 
I met the president. I fell in love with Maureen and Kevin Smith and, and the team. And I have one of the best bosses I've ever had in my life at Dynatron who's supportive and uh, he's a cool dude. We have a fantastic, fantastic team. I've, I have never had more fun in, in all of automotive than I have over the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic. Okay, cool. Cool. So one of the things that, that I've now just kind of pick, picked up on is you've had you've had a series of mentors. You are, you have mentors that you still actively talk to. You have groups of people that you lean on for support, for effort, for documentation, for everything. You've turned a lot of your shortcomings is not the right word, but a lot of the learning that you've taken in, you've turned it into something creative and then created something with it. Like, like the idea of going back a couple of years, thinking just that thing that really resonated is when Pokemon Go got big, you placed business cards and lures at a stop where hundreds of people are going to go at the current time. Yeah, we sold that four is... cars the next day off of it. Right? Actually, like... if we're being honest, it was on a Sunday. We had a pokey stop at the dealership. I would uh -huh. stay there all day on the Sunday paying for the lures, dropping them, and we had people coming in. We sold four cars. Well, in Texas, you're not supposed to be open on Sundays. And so I get a letter from TADA saying that I had a blue law violation <laughs> for dropping those on Sundays and told me never to do that again. So uh, it was a very interesting thing. So it was a big story. It worked. It was a good idea. But I did get a little slap on the wrist from Texas well, Dealers but, Association. Had you done it on Monday, there would be no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In reality, I had you done it on Monday, no problem. Right. But virtually speaking, the point is, it, much like Ryan Reynolds, is that he's a bloody billionaire right now because of fast advertising. Yeah. He took the he took the 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 really huge ad that Peloton had put out and turned the actress that's in it to it into an ad for Aviation Gin. Like within forty eight hours, they had already created an entire campaign, shot the uh, uh, scripted, shot, produced, and published something inside of forty eight hours. That is effectively what you did on a very small scale. Yeah. But effectively what you did, you took something that's trending in the marketplace right now that your customers, more importantly, I think we need to st almost stop th talking about customers, I mean, your audience as a business, it's your audience. You want to keep your audience captivated, be in their feed, right? Yeah. Be in their feed, be doing whatever they're doing, be there. And that works. And I'd love to see, you know, more of that from more adaptable, uh, more adaptable company, or more adaptable companies. And it sounds like you at Dynatron are doing that because we go back to the beginning when we talked about, you know, you had 400 emails on a Saturday morning, the day after you said, Hey, I have this portfolio of things to help you get through this challenge. 400 emails later, you now have a swath of people looking for your help. Now you're, you gave that stuff away, yeah. right? That's yeah. that's give to give. That's now, it. Now, don't don't get me wrong. Uh, I've had people reach out, ask for demos, and and I did get business off of it. You know what I mean? Like, but but that wasn't the intention. The intention was to help someone during a crisis, right? Um, and 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 I built relationships. I, I'll, I'll tell you some of the people that called me. Um, so like a head guy at Greenway called me. A head guy at, and they're calling me on a Saturday, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know they knew who I was, right? So there's guys that are calling me from Lithia and Asbury and different companies, like like big companies, saying, "Hey, how can you help us? Do you have anything else?" And I do have to give a shout out to a guy that we both know. His name's John Acosta. He mm -hmm. brought, him and another guy wrote the process for when CDK comes back up and the best way to enter those ROs. So. John Acosta is a, a, a IT genius. So anytime I have questions on stuff like that, he's the guy to go to. There's not a man with a better heart in all of the industry. Um, I, I love that man. He He's a fantastic person. Um, but he, you know, there's a lot of people that, that helped. So by no means do I take 
full credit for that. I was just the vessel to be able to distribute it, right? So um, it was just a cool thing to get to be able to do. And the response was way overwhelming. And um, a lot of people reached out and said a lot of uh, were uh, that it was super, super helpful. So um, and, and I've been trying to stay in contact with everybody. So I, I, I've since then sent emails, checking on them, seeing how their process went, see if they had any questions, you know, just seeing if they needed any other help. So that's just, uh, I don't know. It was, it's a fun thing to do to connect with people and, uh, and to get to know them. And, uh, you know, I got to meet a guy at the, I went to the all-star game this week. And so a guy that I've never met in person that follows me on social media, sent me a text and said, Hey, can we meet up? Can we meet up? I'm at the all-star game. And so I got to meet him and his son who just turned 16. And, uh, uh, he says, I don't have time to get a beer. I don't have time to get a beer. I'd love to have a beer with you. Uh, we got to get over here to our seats. So I, I, uh, Apple cashed him like 25 bucks and said, all right, beer on me. And so he's like, dude, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Yeah. So like stuff like that really gets me excited. I do have a new cringeworthy. You're going to love this. I do have a new cringeworthy uh, commercial that I thought of this last week. Uh, so I'm going to try to get it recorded in the next couple of weeks and drop it. But um, if if you've ever saw, I used to have this really, really, really big hat, right? Uh -huh. One of those noggin boss hats. And everywhere I go, people ask about that damn hat. So I'm doing a new commercial with that. Uh, nice. Uh, but a new, a different spin on it. So I'm pretty excited about it. I came up with it uh, while I was sitting in a dealership waiting on a GM. I started making notes in my notepad on my phone. So I was sitting there waiting on a GM out out in uh, East Texas and uh, came up with a pretty good idea. So Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're, we're short on time. Um, so I want to get that last little tidbit here from you. You've got a lot of time a lot of time in dealerships, a lot of time around dealerships, and now looking at data from dealerships, what would be your one piece of advice for a mechanic to be happier, healthier, more productive tomorrow? Man, you know, I, I think what I've real about, realized about technicians and mechanics and is they're the least coach department in, a whole, in all of the dealership, right? Most of their training comes from the OEM. So it's hard to be happy in a store to where you don't have a, a set career path or you don't have a way to get better, right? Besides mm -hmm. relying on the OEM. So I, I, me personally, I've had people in my path that always help me create things. And I've seen, I've seen dealerships that put, that put all of the stuff on a whiteboard that says how many classes they have to take, what they have to complete to get to the next level and stuff like that. So in, in the day and age that we're in, career pathing is one of the most important things, one of the most important things out there that we don't focus on, right? And as we start to try to recruit younger technicians and more technicians, it's so important to have those set to where they can, if they want to go from a technician to a salesperson, they can. If they want to go from a technician to a general manager, they can. But it's so important for these dealerships to map that th those things out. Now, as far as happiness goes, um, I don't look at things in happiness. I look at things in fulfillment. And the only way to tr truly be fulfilled is to find where your creativity is and do that. You know, um, as you and I were probably growing up, you weren't creative unless you were artsy or musical. Mm -hmm. right? But what I didn't realize until I was where I'm at now is you can be creative at strategy. You can be creative at problem solving. You can be creative at helping people. You can be creative at all different sorts of stuff, right? But you got to figure out where that's at or you're never going to be truly fulfilled in what you're doing. And that's the most important lesson that, that I share with people is like, once you find that, it's easy to do the things I do because that's where my creativity lies. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something that's outside of yourself, it's always going to be hard. But if you do it that's within your creativity, it makes it 10 times easier. Agreed. Wholeheartedly agreed. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's why we're doing this right now. Yeah. It's why we're doing this right now. I love doing this. A, I get to help people. 
And technically, and, and this is this is the, the, the selfish part, I'm technically helping myself because yeah. two things are happening. I look at it this way. Two things are happening. One, I'm helping myself right now because all the conversations with people that I have, including to people like, and I'm going to get it right this time, it's Brad Pascal, no. including talking to people just like you, I get to have all of these conversations with people I would never have otherwise met way out of my comfort zone. I get to learn stories of... Whoa, I get to learn stories of challenge. I get to learn stories of, of fulfillment. And then I look back, what part of that can I take away from it and say, 20 years ago, I wish I knew this. Yeah. Well, guess what? We're recording this so that the 19-year-old Joshua Taylor, who is just starting in the trade, who doesn't know shit from shit, can go online and listen to two people who've been doing it for 23 years and go, oh, my God, that's that's a great piece of advice. Oh, my God, that's such a great piece of advice. I, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Yeah. And the next episode and the next episode and the next episode and the next episode and panels and lives and shares and content. And every time I get to do something that I get to produce and publish out there, I get to help myself at 19. Yeah. Because I know that at 19-year-old me – struggled so much i don't want anybody to have to go through that stuff on a lot of times unnecessarily right so, mm -hmm. so like i think about things one thing that my dad used to say right and my dad my dad is like redneck well first off he was a plumber when i was growing up right all <laughs> all his career so i grew up working hard digging ditches working after school every day working all every summer um and he went back to school when I was 16 and quit plumbing. And now he's a massage therapist. I know two, 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 two different things, right? I call him, I saw him yesterday uh, and I call him redneck Mr. Miyagi. That's what I call him. So, Red Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, because he can fix, he can fix anything, right? Uh, if you're hurting, if your shoulder's hurting, he can, he can, he, it's, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll fix it for you, right? Gotcha. So, he's a beast. He, he works on olympic athletes college athletes all kinds of stuff in lubbock he's the number one rated massage therapist in lubbock right but my dad is a hardcore problem solver and that's probably where i get it right but one thing he used to tell me all the time is like if i didn't want to go work on a saturday he used to tell me this and, and i didn't understand what it meant until i was like in my 20s and he would say you can do what you want to but you might not be able to do what you want to Mm -hmm. I'm like, what does that mean? And so what I realized is, man, it's about sacrifice, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you want instant gratification. If you do that, you might not be able to do something down the road. And so like, that's always stuck with me. So over the last couple of years, I've got to do some really, really amazing things that I never, never could dream of when I was a little kid, right? Mm -hmm. Because I grew up in a fairly, you know, I would say mid to lower I would say the lower end of middle class, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I never got to do a, th a lot of things that my friends did in high school and stuff like that. Uh, and now I get to do things that are just uh, uh, amazing and I I'm very, very thankful. So my dad has taught me a lot of a lot of different lessons. One lesson that I always realize is, man, it, uh, this is why I wear a baseball cap, right? Is mm -hmm. because of him, right? I when I first started in the car business, I'm like, how do I brand myself? And I was like, you know what? My dad used we used to wear a baseball cap every single day to protect your head whenever you're crawling to your houses, to give out to customers, to you know, it had your logo on it, and so it it was a tool that we used for pretty much everything, right? And so this hat is uh, what I call a psychological anchor. And each mm. one of us need, sorry, each one of us need that in our lives, right? Um, and if we don't have a psychological anchor to go from work mode to home mode, it will cause all kinds of havoc in your life. And so when I take this hat off or I switch it out or I do stuff like that, like when I put it on, it's work time. When I take it off, it's home time, mm. right? So. Okay. That's something that, that's something. I think that's that. your tip. What? I think that's your piece of advice. Yeah. Find a way to turn the switch off, yeah. both mentally and physically. Just turn the switch off. When you leave the shop, 
Find a way to turn the switch off. Yeah, and if you have something like that, there's so many different ways that you can do it. It used to cause a lot of fights between me and my wife because she would come home and I'd still be in problem solving mode. And sometimes she just wants me to listen. So mm -hmm. you can, this is, this is marriage advice and customer advice right here. So this is a big one. Do you so, want solutions or do you want to listen? Start, want me to listen? Start asking the question. Do you want me to experience this with you? Or is this something you want me to help you solve? Yeah. If you ask that question, you know, or you ask permission to solve stuff with customers, right? After mm -hmm. working for a little while, hey, is it okay if I help you solve this real quick? That diffuses everything. And so then she realizes, like, she has to think about it for a second and say, no, I need your help. Or no, I just want to vent, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it gives you a break to switch modes, but it also gives her, your wife or your significant other a break to decide which one they want, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been game changer. Game changer in our relation. We don't fight about anything because because we ask those questions to each other like that. And on that bombshell, I think that's a great way to end the show. That's uh, I don't I, I know I've known about that for a while. I haven't been successful at regularly asking the question. I need to get better at that. That's a way for me to improve too. So folks, I think that's a great way to end the show. How do you get in touch with Brad? Yeah, so you can email me. My email is uh, bpascal, P-A-S-C-H-A-L, at dynatronsoftware.com. Or you can always text me, 806-548-2468. Um, I am open every hour your dealership's open. And that's what I tell everybody. Uh, I answered, uh, Lee Brown, Baxter Automotive, called me the other day. Mm-hmm. And I was in the sauna and I answered his call and then he's like, you're ridiculous. And he's like, and I only did it cause he's a good friend, but I, I asked him if he wanted me to FaceTime and he said, no. So, uh, I, but I told him, I always preach to him that I answered my phone anytime he's open. And so I thought that was a funny way to get my point across. So I think, you know, it's taking it right out of, out of Larry Feldman's playbook, right? All pick up the phone and always answer the phone. Yeah. Right. Pick up the phone or always answer the phone, one or the other. But I think that's that's an awesome piece of advice, folks. I think uh, we're gonna cap it there, and because I don't want to give away any more nuggets. <laughs> there is so I got I've got like thirty five mark clips on this episode alone, folks. So there's gonna be so many clips. Just check out the shorts. You might not even need to take in the whole long form content because you're gonna be able to get it all in the shorts because there's so many clips, so many clips. And I hope you guys are are really enjoying the show. I hope you subscribe to the show and I hope you check out the sweatyleader.com because in August we're having our last free webinar. You know, when, by the time this airs, we will have already done our second, which we did in June. We did in July, both sold out shows as it were uh, lots of great feedback. I'm hoping to be able to post the reviews and all of the information back from that here shortly by the time this airs. And then uh, we'll be having uh, the August show again, this, I'll put it on the screen, the sweatyleader.com, the last free one that I'm going to do. And our quote for the week, as we always do when we sign off on the show, I found a good one. I think this is a great way to end considering how many mentors uh, Brad has and how many bits of feedback and nuggets are in the whole show. Metaphors have a way of holding the most truth in the least space. Orson Scott Card. Remember, folks, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.